Hello, welcome to Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Jeannie Poole, the Editor-in-Chief for the Heart Rhythm O2 Journal. Today I have with me three members of our editorial board. Saman Nasarian, Section Editor, Jeff Healy, Associate Editor, and Nazem Akum, also Associate Editor. Thank you, all three of you, for joining us today. So our special December um, issue is going to publish on December 17th. This is a issue that is dedicated to arrhythmias in heart failure. In total, there are 22 articles, which includes both original articles as well as review papers. And today, each of the editors that are joining us are going to discuss one of the papers that they chose because they thought it had a particular interest or particular interesting messages. So let's start with you, Nazem. Um, you chose to discuss the paper called Cardioprotective Effects of Dantrolene in Doxorubicin-Induced Cardiomyopathy in Mice. The first author is Dr. Mohammed Ali Azam. So what did this study show? This is a, thank you, Jeannie, for uh, this opportunity. Um, this is a very interesting study uh, that investigators out of the University of Toronto conducted. As you mentioned, um, there are two lead authors on it, Mohammed Azam and uh, Praloy uh, Chakrabarty. Uh, the senior author is uh, Nantha Kumar, um, and the investigators are at the University of Toronto. Um, the problem they tried to address is um, the cardiotoxic effects of the chemotherapeutic agent doxorubicin. And um, this is thought to be mediated through an overload in intracellular calcium and reactive oxygen species. And prior work by them and others have uh, shown that uh, using dantrolene uh, may actually be able to be protective or reverse some of the toxic effects of doxorubicin. And why dantrolene? This is a agent typically used as a uh, something to protect against hy uh, malignant hyperthermia, uh, but prior studies have shown that it may uh, have some protective effects on the heart through a stabilizing effect on the ranadine receptor. So um, the investigators decided to study it um, in the context of doxorubicin uh, toxicity in mice. Um, so they uh, conducted experiments in uh, mice that were administered doxorubicin and uh, some comparison groups, including a dantrolene group and also a doxorubicin plus dantrolene group. And they showed that the doxorubicin effect on mouse hearts in terms of contractility and also uh, calcium metabolism and, and uh, calcium transients, transients and alternants uh, were uh, definitely there with doxorubicin, but were, they were all alleviated with administration of dantrolene. So a very uh, promising study, uh, potentially for a large patient population ultimately, because doxorubicin continues to be used as a chemotherapeutic agent for solid tumors and some hematological malignancies uh, with no effective uh, clinical treatments uh, at this point. Uh, some uh, guideline-directed medical therapies and beta blockade and urinohormonal blockade have not actually shown benefit in this population. So potential uh, for a lot of good out of this uh, paper, but it definitely requires more uh, investigation, more prospective studies, uh, hopefully in humans at some point. Um, there are some limitations, admittedly. It's a mouse model study. It's all male mice, so we need to make sure that uh, it also works in, in uh, both sexes. And um, the, uh, the concern is that uh, whether dantrolene can attenuate the beneficial effect of the chemotherapy that doxorubicin offers. And there's no evidence of that in, in the animals and hopefully that'll also be translated into larger animals and humans. So it's a promising proof of, proof of concept study that definitely requires follow-up, but it definitely caught my attention as, a, as something to build on for the future. Right, thanks for that great summary. Dantrolene certainly has gotten into the literature over the last couple of years, mostly also in, in animal studies, as you point out. So um, hopefully we'll start seeing some studies in humans being done as we go forward in the next couple of years. It sounds like a pretty exciting and promising um, drug. Well, thanks, Nazem. Saman, let's talk about the paper you chose. Um, the title of this paper is Sacubitril Valsartan versus Angiotensin Inhibitors and Arrhythmia Endpoints in Heart Failure with Reduced Ejection Fraction. And the first author is Dr. Amanda Fernandez. 
Yeah, thank you, Jimmy, for the invitation to discuss these um, interesting papers. Um, I like this paper in particular because um, you know, there's increasing data that uh, angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitors, and in particular, um, secubitferal valsartan, um, reduces the risk of hospitalization and death from cardiovascular causes more effectively than ACE inhibitors. And the authors in this study performed a meta-analysis for from randomized five observational studies to see if these agents, the um, ANRIs, compared with ACE inhibitors or ARBs affected arrhythmia, and, uh, arrhythmia endpoints in patients with heart failure. So what they found was that in those patients that uh, received AR, ARNIs, there were fewer sudden deaths, uh, ventricular arrhythmias, and appropriate ICD therapies. Interestingly, um, biventricular pacing rates were higher. And um, they didn't find a difference in terms of atrial arrhythmia. So probably the biventricular pacing um, effectiveness was because of reduction of uh, PVCs under non-sustained VT. And uh, so overall, it does seem like there's a benefit. And um, when uh, they narrowed the, the study design only to the randomized studies and uh, did a meta-analytic study of those, the sudden death endpoint still remained um, positive. So I think it's very promising. And you know, I think it's particularly important for us as electrophysiologists because we are referred to quite a lot of patients with ventricular arrhythmias. Um, and um, you know, at least in my practice, I see some here and there that are not on these newer agents. And um, I think we could probably have a more effective role in uh, making sure that the patients are receiving the most up-to-date therapies. And then the question, you know, I, I would love to discuss with you as someone who has quite a bit of experience in terms of trials looking at uh, sudden death prevention and primary prophylaxis uh, patients, uh, candidates, is, is it time now with these new agents to take another look and see if the relative benefit of defibrillators has changed with these new agents? Yeah, so this is definitely something that I've um, spoken to at different conferences over the last couple of years. I mean, I remember looking at the intrestinal, you know, the first intrestinal study that came out. Um, I, I was so impressed with the reduction in sudden death, and it was a very small percentage of people in that trial that even had an ICD, and yet sudden death was reduced. And if you go back and look at the paper that Wayne Levy from our institution published in Jack a number of years ago, that just on standard triple therapy heart failure medications, you reduce sudden death by 60%. Now, the ICD on top of that reduces it further. But um, it's, it's the kind of reduction that we saw in sudden death reduction in scud heft and in um, made it too. So I think these um, you know, very powerful guideline directed medical therapy options are so interesting. They, have, they are changing heart failure um, and they have um, endpoints that are arrhythmia reducing endpoints. And so I think you know, we'll, as we look, especially at the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patient population further, you know, that was studying Danish, um, we'll, we'll see in people who are on up-to-date guideline-directed medical therapy what the benefit of ICD therapy um, really is over the course of time. So, yeah. I think it's a uh, good question, Saman. I mean, the, the, the patients, the legacy patients have had devices for some time. I mean, uh, many groups uh, around the world are doing heart failure optimization in their ICD clinic, and uh, we do indeed see uh, patients whose ejection fractions do come up over the original impact plant threshold. And, uh, you know, I think that's an important point to consider uh, now moving forward. Also, you know, again, as electrophysiologists, we sometimes need to be reminded that when our, you know, ICD patients particularly have a shock for VT or have a detection of atrial fibrillation, that the, the big adverse outcome that that signals actually isn't a sudden death or a stroke, it's actually heart failure hospitalization. And this is really, uh, you know, this is why I think this issue on heart failure and arrhythmia is, is such a great issue uh, because uh, we need to be reminded sometimes that our, that our patients in the EP world are actually heart failure patients in many cases. Thanks, Jeff. So you've um, basically stepped into your slot here today. But <laughs> thanks, Simon, for that great paper. I think that, you know, it will engender a lot of discussion. But um, so um, Jeff Healy um, is going to talk about the third and last paper. It's called Advanced Management of Ventricular Arrhythmias and Chronic Chagas Cardiomyopathy by Dr. David Santa Cruz and colleagues. Yeah, Jeff, thank tell you. us about this. Yeah, thank you, Jeannie. This is, this is a very, very nice paper, and I enjoyed reading it. 
Um, it, it's a comprehensive overview of a topic that, you know, many people practicing in North America, Western Europe would only see rarely, if at all. Um, whereas, you know, it, it really is quite relevant to a large portion of the membership of HRS and the readership of HRO2 uh, coming from parts of the world where uh, shag, chronic shagas cardiomyopathy is in fact endemic. And uh, I think it's, it's a really good read for, for people like myself where it's not so common just to understand what it's about because uh, in many ways it's like uh, typical dilated cardiomyopathy in some ways it's quite different. So it's a nice review paper, very rich in graphics and electrograms and images of uh, 3D maps and things. So it's a very attractive paper to read for the practicing EP doctor. Uh, they talk about the, you know, the, the, just the basic uh, prevalence, about 7 million people around the world affected by uh, chronic Chagas cardiomyopathy. Uh, it does have a, a characteristic predilection to be left ventricle around the mitral valve, so the basal uh, lateral and basal inferior areas where the scar does occur. It, it tends to be transmural with a preponderance for epicardial. So uh, when uh, ablations are done, about a quarter of the patients require epicardial ablation. So that is a, a discriminating fact that people should know. Uh, and so it really kind of places it in perspective. And again, uh, we all uh, now with the uh, movement of people around the world, we do uh, occasionally run into some shagus disease. I've seen it. And, uh, and uh, it's good to have a toolkit of uh, knowledge to deal with that. Uh, typically, patients with chronic Chagas cardiomyopathy, the review article goes on to state that, you know, typical uh, conduction disease is typical for most, right? Bundle branch block is common with a positive predicted value of around 80%. Uh, frequent PVCs are common. And in fact, in patients that have, uh, you know, conduction disturbance and chronic Chagas disease, they're almost ubiquitous uh, to have frequent PVCs, typically multifocal in nature. Uh, they, the authors go on to talk about various investigations that can be done. They do a lot of focus on MRI, uh, where they have found this to be useful. And if greater than uh, two segments are involved with gadolinium uptake and SCAR, uh, this has a, a very good prediction about a fourfold relative risk increase for ventricular tachycardia. So uh, really good background and uh, risk stratification uh, in this review paper. They talk about, you know, the prognosis. I don't think many of us knew that in chronic Chagas cardiomyopathy, the mortality at five years is 35%. And if you go up to 10 years, the mortality is about 60%. And uh, that in and of itself is, uh, you know, cause for pause. Um, many scales have been done. The Rassi score, Antonio Rassi Jr., who was one of the uh, big leaders in, in a workup of Chagas cardiomyopathy, adult, the score looking at uh, NYJ class, left ventricular uh, dilatation dysfunction, non stem ventricular tachycardia, low voltage in male sex. And again, for the highest grouping of risk score, uh, the mortality of five years is already about 60%. So a lot is known about how to stratify risk and understand that. And then the final part of the paper talks about how do we treat it. So beta blockers, yes. Um, the direct antiparasitic agents have been helpful for acute Chagas disease, but disappointing in chronic Chagas disease. So the benefit trial being the large study of besnitazole uh, really didn't move the needle on hard clinical outcomes, despite really knocking down parasite loads in chronic Chagas cardiomyopathy. Uh, and uh, so the medical therapy, you know, often amiodarone is employed, of course, ICDs, secondary prevention, like every other indication, primary prevention, uh, a little more uh, controversy just uh, in part due to access issues to ICDs. So there are clinical trials ongoing specifically in Chagas cardiomyopathy. And then the really nice part of the paper that I, I really read over quite detailed was a, a look at ablation in uh, Chagas cardiomyopathy and just, you know, how many of the same things, mid-diastolic potentials during VT, late potentials during sinus rhythm and some of the newer mapping techniques, how they were used uh, to achieve success in ablation. Again, often needing an epicardial approach. So it's a good round stem to stern uh, review of Chagas cardiomyopathy. And I think, you know, it would be useful for most of our colleagues to read something like this at least once uh, to have some memory of this. That's fantastic. Thanks for that overview. I was thinking when you mentioned that um, we're seeing more of it in the United States, I saw a statistic a number of years ago that um, in New York, and I don't remember now, excuse me for not remembering who it was that published this, but in their population of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy um, patients, they, it was up to about 10 to 12% of patients in one area of New York had been diagnosed with Chagas disease. Uh, so undoubtedly, we'll all see more of it. It's important to recognize 
you know, the management is very similar to other different kinds of cardiomyopathic um, syndromes. You know, like you mentioned, epicardial scar, like, uh, you know, we have to face with um, sarcoid can be challenging for uh, VT ablation. But um, I, I do agree with you that this is a great review paper and a good way to catch up on um, what Chagas disease is all about. All right, well, I think we're out of time. So I just wanna thank the three of you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And I wanna invite all of our viewers to explore the special issue. It has a lot of other great articles and also of course our regular December issue, um, which published 15 articles, which are up online already and available. Thanks so much for your time and we'll see you next time on HRS TV.